About 10 years ago, I stepped off my motorbike on a dusty village path in the newly independent African nation of South Sudan and hammered a sign to the trunk of a tree. The sign depicted two people standing by the edge of a pond, one of them on a crutch with a long, painful worm slithering out of his leg, and the other, a woman with a bandage, waving him off as if to say, no, don't enter the water with that worm. Guinea worm disease, a tiny parasite that causes debilitating worms to slowly grow and emerge from the body, is spread through the water like a well or a pond. And if anyone else drinks it, they too can get sick. That's how guinea worms spread for thousands of years. It's even referenced in the Bible as the fiery serpent. Until a global campaign led by former U.S. President Jimmy Carter nearly eradicated it from our earth forever. My job with the Carter Center team was to help teach people how to prevent the disease. When the guinea worm campaign started decades ago, three and a half million people worldwide were infected with the disease, keeping them from going to work or school and adding to the misery of war, famine, and poverty they were already feeling in countries like South Sudan. The Guinea Worm Eradication Program is one of public health's most celebrated success stories. Not because the disease kills lots of people like malaria or tuberculosis, but because of the age-old tool used to stop it, education. You see, there's no vaccine to prevent guinea worm disease and there's no medication to treat it. The best way to stop guinea worm is to prevent it from happening in the first place by teaching people how it works and convincing them not to go into the water when they're sick. That takes a culture shift a change in behavior, not heavy machinery, not extravagant technology, not billions of dollars. Simple education. Today, just 14 people remain with guinea worm disease. Our world is facing another challenge right now that also needs basic education to make it work, sustainability. Humans have been around for 200,000 years but it's only in the last 200 years we've suddenly grown from 1 billion people to nearly 8 billion people. The lifestyles we lead right now would take more than one planet to fulfill. We cut down our trees, pollute our waters, litter our lands, divide animal migration routes, overextract resources that dump them in our landfills, and emit gases in the sky that trap the sun's heat from returning to space where it belongs. The way we treat these incredible resources is damaging the habitats we depend on for our food, threatening the wildlife we know and love, costing our economy trillions of dollars each year, changing the climate and weather, and worsening our health. A lot of this is because of what we make and buy, how we move around, what we do with our stuff when we're finished with it. Most importantly, we don't have a culture of sustainability, in large part because we're not teaching about it. If we don't cool it soon, a lot of this change could be irreversible. After all, we can't afford a single-use planet. So here's my idea. It's nothing groundbreaking or fancy. In fact, it's not even my idea. It's more of a reminder to all of us. We need to make sustainability education a part of everyday life. Let me ask you a question. Where did you learn to live sustainably? Was it at home? At school? Growing up here in Nashville, I didn't know what that meant. In school, I learned about ecosystems and biodiversity, not how to save the planet from my own kitchen table. My dad used to take me and my brother fishing on a quiet lake in the summer times. I loved watching tadpoles squiggle along its banks, deer peek out from the tall woods, and mist lift from the sky-colored surface of the water. My appreciation for nature grew immense and deep, but I didn't notice how my own way of life, leaving the water running while brushing my teeth, or forgetting to turn out the lights, or fueling up the family station wagon, had anything to do with protecting it, and how it affected lower-income families in my own neighborhood. 
When I got a job, I didn't know how traveling for work or tossing leftovers from the break room or printing on just one side of the paper made any difference. In fact, I didn't know much of this until just recently. To me, living sustainably is about caring for what we have, but doing so in a way that protects our livelihoods and our human rights at the same time. Learning how to live sustainably means thinking upstream about where our environmental problems start in the places we learn and work and live. It's about understanding our personal responsibilities as consumers and how all these things, saving energy, ending food waste, reusing plastic bags, building greener buildings and cleaning up our air connect at the roots. Sustainability education needs to be taught simply and positively and in a way that celebrates other people's values. Other countries are already doing it right. Costa Rica, for example, has made learning about sustainable living compulsory in schools. And Japan has a national registry of experts teaching best practices to the public. What these countries have figured out is that education is cheaper than cleaning up our mess later on. And that it needs to be woven into the fabric of who we are and as common as signs for washing our hands. It needs to be everywhere, all the time. So, here's my proposal. First, we need to make learning how to live sustainably a part of our classrooms. Educators of all kinds, whether they teach sixth grade science or art camp for preschoolers, homeschool their children or run a childcare center, need to know how to teach the basics of sustainability. Sustainable living needs to be a part of our academic standards at all grade levels and subjects and tied to project-based learning, social-emotional learning, service learning, in the integrated fields of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math, or STEAM. Principals and school administrators need to make sustainability education a top priority in their curricula, use their cafeterias and facilities as demonstration sites, and build professional development opportunities for their instructors to learn more year-round, not just as educators, but for themselves as models of sustainable behavior. And parents of students need to be advocates for reinforcing that learning at home. Second, we need to make learning how to live sustainably a part of our workplaces. Everyone, from the CEO to the staff, volunteers, and the customers who walk through the front door need to be learning sustainable practices within their businesses. Companies, nonprofits, government offices, these need to be laboratories of learning and exploring sustainable behavior, inspiring new staff to train new things, re-engineer products and services, shape public policy, and hold vendors more accountable. From the day they're hired until the day they retire, employees need to be constantly exposed to new tips and strategies for working more sustainably, helping them rethink systems, adjust to failure, celebrate individual achievements. Our workplaces need to be places where students who grow up learning about sustainability in school want to work and commit themselves to great results. It needs to be a part of the mission and the values. And third, we need to make learning how to live sustainably a part of our households. Culture begins at home, and families can be our most influential teachers. Parents, children, relatives, and friends need to know the basics of sustainable life and where they can learn more throughout the year. Parents in particular need to know what it means to make sustainable decisions for their families if they're not already doing it and come together year-round to share and learn what's working in their homes. Like businesses, households too can be little labs for trying new things like how to compost food scraps in the backyard or reuse packaging in a safe space where it's okay to learn from our mistakes and not be judged for them. And everyone deserves access to sustainability information, even if you don't have internet service or you live in a rural neighborhood. All of us have a right to learn. We need to remember the choices we make have a profound impact on vulnerable communities. People of color and other historically marginalized groups 
whether they're poor or elderly or disabled, often contribute the least to humanity's impact, yet suffer the most from it. Professor Robert Bullard, the father of the environmental justice movement in the United States, says that environmental justice means all of us have the right to equal protection of environmental law. We can't teach sustainability without talking frankly about equity. All of us need to understand environmental justice, how we fit into the story of disparity, and what our unique powers are to make a change. We all need to learn how to listen more closely to the voices of disadvantaged communities, especially when we're creating lessons that ultimately affect them. Climate justice is racial justice, and we all have a role to play. So here's my charge to all of us. If we truly want to be sustainable, we first need to be educational. Think about how we can make our businesses, our schools, our homes more educational, and teach the people we love how to take care of what we share. It doesn't take much. As we've learned from guinea worm, a little change goes a long way. And if we remember the basics, we can turn this challenge of our lifetime into the achievement of our lifetime. Thank you.